They're sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals in, in Ukraine. They could be the richest country in all of Europe. I don't want to give that money and those assets to Putin to share with China. If we help Ukraine now, they can become the best business partner we ever dreamed of. A U.S. senator has said the quiet part loud and warned that the West cannot afford to lose the war in Ukraine because he said Ukraine is a gold mine that has 10 to 12 trillion dollars worth of critical minerals that the West needs. And this U.S. Senator, Lindsey Graham from the Republican Party, he insisted that the West must continue sending more and more weapons to Ukraine in order to protect these minerals and prevent them from falling into the hands of Russia and by extension, China. Lindsey Graham made these comments in an interview on CBS on June 10th. By the way, a quick note for context. He began this clip talking about how Donald Trump provided weapons to Ukraine as loans. That is that Ukraine had to pay the US back for those weapons. So the context of this clip is that Lindsey Graham is strongly implying that Ukraine should pay the West using its minerals to pay for the billions of dollars of weapons that they have given to Ukraine. What did Trump do to get the weapons flowing? He created a loan system. They're sitting on 10 to $12 trillion of critical minerals in, in Ukraine. They could be the richest country in all of Europe. I don't want to give that money and those assets to Putin to share with China. If we help Ukraine now, they can become the best business partner we ever dreamed of. That 10 to $12 trillion of critical mineral assets could be yeah. used by Ukraine and the West not given to Putin and China. This is a very big deal, how Ukraine ends. Mm -hmm. Let's help them win a war we can't afford to lose. Let's find a solution to this war. But they're sitting on a gold mine to give Putin 10 or $12 trillion of critical minerals that yeah. he will share with uh, China is ridiculous. Now, these remarks are very revealing because for years, the United States has claimed that it must support Ukraine in order to protect democracy. Now, this is despite the fact that the Ukrainian government has been very undemocratic. Back in 2022, NPR reported that the Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky had consolidated all of Ukraine's TV outlets. He imposed martial law and the state took control of all media. And furthermore, Zelensky dissolved rival political parties, as NPR reported. He banned 11 opposition political parties, including, by the way, all of the major left wing parties, all of the socialist and communist parties were banned in Ukraine because they were deemed so-called pro-Russian parties. Meanwhile, Zelensky has overstayed his term in office, which was supposed to end in May 2024, he has continued without a democratic mandate, and the major French newspaper Le Monde referred to Zelensky as, quote, a president with no term end. In fact, two former U.S. diplomats published a very revealing article in Newsweek in 2023 titled, Ukraine sure does not look like a democracy anymore. I want to read a few highlights from this article. It notes that in May 2022, the Ukrainian parliament passed a law formally banning all opposition parties. President Vladimir Zelensky signed the law. Among the parties that were banned included the Opposition Platform for Life Party, which had 10% of the seats in parliament. Furthermore, another 11 banned parties include the Socialist Party of Ukraine, the Progressive Socialist Party of Ukraine, the Union of Left Forces, and the Communist Party of Ukraine. All have been banned under the right-wing NATO-backed regime. Furthermore, it notes that Ukraine has banned elections. Ukraine has put the democratic process itself on hold since declaring martial law in 2022. Furthermore, it notes that Democracies are not supposed to censor the media, but the Ukrainian government in February 2022 ordered the nine largest television networks in Ukraine to combine their news operations into a single state-controlled news program called Telemarathon. 
In April 2022, the National Security Council ordered three independent television channels associated with Zelensky's predecessor taken off the air. In December 2022, Zelensky signed a law which gave the National Broadcasting Council statutory authority to regulate all print broadcast and digital media. Now, keep in mind, that was an article written by former U.S. diplomats. This is not random activists. If we look at what's actually happening on the ground in Ukraine, and if we look at these comments from U.S. politicians like Lindsey Graham, we can see that the war in Ukraine has nothing to do with so-called democracy and certainly not human rights. Now, it goes without saying that one significant reason motivating the U.S. and NATO to support Ukraine is geopolitics. The U.S. is trying to weaken Russia. This was stated explicitly by the U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, who also worked for U.S. weapons corporations before he was appointed the head of the Pentagon. In 2022, Lloyd Austin visited Ukraine, and as the Washington Post reported, he said very clearly that the United States wants to weaken Russia in Ukraine. That point is obvious, but it's not just political, it is also economic. U.S. investors, big corporations, big asset managers like BlackRock on Wall Street have made many billions of dollars in profits over the war in Ukraine. And I discussed this in a previous video and a report, which I will link to in the description below, looking at how Ukraine is being sold to Wall Street. And back in 2022, Zelensky symbolically rang the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange and he announced that Ukraine was open for business, as he said. And he also revealed that with the backing of the U.S. government and right wing economists in the U.S. and big corporations, that Ukraine was offering four hundred billion dollars worth of investments, selling off state assets for pennies on the dollar. Now, for context, Ukraine's GDP is under $200 billion, and yet it's offering $400 billion in investments, more than two times the size of the entire country's GDP of all of Ukraine's economy. And asset managers on Wall Street like BlackRock, which have trillions of dollars of assets under management, they invest the wealth of rich people in order to make them richer and richer. Well, meanwhile, BlackRock and other Wall Street firms are investing many billions of dollars in Ukraine and they are profiting from this war. And their wealthy clients, oligarchs from the US and around the world, are profiting from this war. And I should add that it's not just Wall Street, it's also the military industrial complex that is profiting from this war. As of May 2024, in just two years of this war in Ukraine, the U.S. Congress approved $175 billion of aid for Ukraine. That included $117 billion in defense spending, in military support, weapons, and $57 billion in non-defense support. Now, I should emphasize here that a lot of this spending is not going necessarily directly to Ukraine. It is going to the U.S. military industrial complex. It is going to U.S. military contractors, big weapons corporations that are making billions of dollars in profits, creating missiles and tanks and guns and ammunition and other military technology that is going to Ukraine. So when people in the West, when they say, you know, that we're being so kind and we're helping Ukraine so much. Well, this is not just benevolence. Obviously, it's actually Ukrainians who are the ones losing their lives, fighting to the last Ukrainian on behalf of the U.S. and NATO. But it's not just that. U.S. corporations are making profits hand over foot, profiting off of this war with big, big, fat, juicy government contracts to build all of this military technology. So this is a huge stimulus for the US government. This is military Keynesianism. So Wall Street benefits, big corporate asset managers and investors benefit, the military industrial complex benefits, 
and average working Ukrainians are the ones losing their lives on behalf of Western capital. And this brings me back to the comments that were made by Lindsey Graham, the U.S. senator, who said openly that the U.S. and the Western countries want to get access to the 10 to 12 trillion dollars of mineral resources in Ukraine. This was revealed in an article in The Washington Post back in August 2022 with a very blatant title, quote, in the Ukraine war, a battle for the nation's mineral and energy wealth. The Washington Post reported, quote, Ukraine harbors some of the world's largest reserves of titanium and iron ore, fields of untapped lithium, and massive deposits of coal. Collectively, they are worth tens of trillions of dollars. The newspaper then added that Ukraine has, quote, myriad other reserves, including stores of natural gas, oil, and rare earth minerals, essential for certain high-tech components that could hamper Western Europe's search for alternatives to imports from Russia and China. This point is key. The major U.S. newspaper referred to Ukraine as a, quote, raw material mother load that is home to 117 of 120 of the most widely used minerals and metals and a major source of fossil fuels and again, they, they estimated that in the war zone going on in eastern Ukraine, that there is at least $12.4 trillion worth of Ukraine's energy deposits, metals, and minerals. This is where the figure cited by the Senator Lindsey Graham came from. Now, one of the key considerations that was highlighted both in the comments from Lindsey Graham and in the Washington Post article is that the United States wants to prevent China and Russia from having access to some of these important minerals. Now, first of all, I should point out this is rather strange because Russia is actually one of the world's top producers of all of these commodities. If you look at the list of the major raw materials, metals, minerals, fossil fuels in the world, Russia is always near the top of the top 10. Russia has so many trillions of dollars of minerals and natural resources and fossil fuels and oil and gas. It does not need access to all of this in Ukraine. So it's it's rather strange and funny hearing the Western powers talk about this as if Russia is desperate. But what the U.S. is concerned about is trying to weaken China's economy and trying to prevent China from having access to some very important critical strategic minerals because China is the world's industrial superpower and the U.S. is trying to prevent China from competing in cutting edge technology industries, in particular in electric vehicles, in batteries, in semiconductors. This is why the U.S. government has imposed tariffs and export restrictions on these major Chinese industries. And CNBC published a very revealing article in 2024 titled U.S. Very Concerned About China's Dominance as Critical Minerals Supplier, Energy Chief Says. The article noted that China is the undisputed leader in the critical mineral supply chain, accounting for roughly 60% of the world's production of rare earth minerals and materials. The White House released a fact sheet in 2022 emphasizing that the Biden administration is working on securing a made in America supply chain for critical minerals. It warned of China's influence over the global supply chain. And in particular, it named things like rare earth elements, lithium and cobalt, which are key inputs in clean energy technologies like batteries, electric vehicles, wind turbines and solar panels. And again, these are the industries in China that the U.S. has targeted with an economic war and a trade war. And some of these rare earth elements, lithium, cobalt, and other critical minerals are located in Ukraine, which has very large reserves. And almost immediately after Joe Biden came to power in 2021, he signed an executive order in which he revealed that, the, that Washington is focused very heavily on trying to restrict China's influence in global critical mineral supply chains. 
This has become a hot issue in Washington. In fact, this year, 2024, U.S. Congress members, both Republicans and Democrats, introduced legislation that they say will counter Chinese dominance in the critical mineral supply chains. And the U.S. Senator Todd Young, a Republican, said, quote, the Chinese Communist Party is aggressively attempting to monopolize critical mineral resources, and the United States urgently needs to diversify our supply chain and strengthen ties with allies. And of course, one of those allies is Ukraine that has trillions of dollars of minerals that the U.S. would very much like to get its hands on. Now, I do want to stress here that this is not the only reason for the war for critics who are going to say that this is a crazy conspiracy. I'm not saying that the only reason that this war is happening is because the U.S. and big multinational corporations want to get access to Ukraine's natural resources. Again, as I acknowledged, there are many geopolitical considerations weakening Russia. The U.S. wants Ukraine to join NATO, the military bloc led by the U.S. Europe wants Ukraine to join the European Union and they can get access not only to Ukrainian natural resources, but also cheap labor. Ukraine has a well-educated workforce that are actually paid very low wages compared to the rest of Europe. Ukraine has in fact suffered from some of the most poverty in all of Europe and some of the lowest wages. So European companies can benefit if Ukraine joins the EU from exploiting low-paid, well-educated Ukrainian labor. There are many different motivations. I'm not saying it's only because of minerals, but you cannot ignore the fact that U.S. government officials like Lindsey Graham and media outlets like the Washington Post are openly saying that the West wants to get access to the trillions of dollars of minerals in Ukraine. This is a significant factor that we need to talk about. And I should add that this is not the first time that U.S. government officials have openly boasted that they were trying to overthrow a foreign government and take their natural resources. This has happened many times. Donald Trump said it very openly in a Republican Party rally in 2023. Trump talked about the coup attempt against Venezuela's democratically elected leftist government that he kicked off in 2019. And Trump boasted, he said, if only we had overthrown the Venezuelan government, if our coup had succeeded, we would have gotten access to all of that oil. He said we would have taken over Venezuela. Here's that clip. Venezuela. How about we're buying oil from Venezuela? When I left, Venezuela was ready to collapse. We would have taken it over. We would have gotten all that oil. It would have been right next door. But now we're buying oil from Venezuela, so we're making a dictator very rich. Can you believe this? Nobody can believe it. And Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, a hardline neoconservative war hawk, he made very similar comments as well in 2019 during the coup attempt in Venezuela. He did an interview on Fox News, and John Bolton said that it would make a big difference if U.S. companies could invest in and produce oil in Venezuela. So, of course, it's not just getting access to these natural resources. It's the U.S. government is acting on behalf of big corporations in the U.S., especially fossil fuel corporations that want to get access to these resources so they can profit, so their shareholders can get richer. And of course, many of these companies, they fund the campaigns of politicians, both Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. They buy elections, essentially, and their shareholders are some of the major constituents lobbying U.S. politicians, funding their campaigns, and their shareholders want to get richer and richer off of these natural resources. And I should add that the U.S. government doesn't really hide this at all. It's pretty blatant. In fact, do you remember who Donald Trump's first secretary of state was before the neoconservative Mike Pompeo? It was Rex Tillerson. And what was his political experience? Well, his actual experience was not necessarily directly political. It was indirectly political. Rex Tillerson was the CEO of ExxonMobil, the world's largest private oil company. If you look at a list of the 10 largest oil companies on Earth, the first three of them are state-owned companies. There's Saudi Aramco of Saudi Arabia. 
China's China Petroleum and Chemical and PetroChina. And the fourth largest on Earth is ExxonMobil. And of course, again, the CEO of Exxon was the Secretary of State, the head of the U.S. State Department under Donald Trump. It's not just a revolving door in the U.S. The U.S. government is run by these top executives from big corporations and U.S. government policy is made on their behalf. Now, before I conclude, I want to look at one other comment that was made by the U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham in this interview that he did on CBS. And in this part, he called for the U.S. and Europe to seize the more than $300 billion of Russian assets that were frozen by Western banks. This is calling for one of the biggest acts of theft in world history. In this interview, Senator Graham recalled a meeting that he had in Kiev with the Ukrainian leader Zelensky. And he said that Zelensky asked the U.S. government to seize these assets from Russia and to use them to fund Ukraine, to fund the weapons and to pay off its debts and fund reconstruction. Here is this clip. Here's what he wanted most of all, for us to go after the Russian assets all over the world, take the money from the sovereign wealth funds of Russia and give it to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. There's $300 billion uh, sitting in Europe from Russian sovereign wealth assets that we should seize and give to Ukraine. We have Russian money in America we should seize. Now, in response to what he said there, I do want to issue a correction. Lindsey Graham said that this is money from Russia's sovereign wealth fund. But in reality, we're talking about $300 billion of assets that belong to Russia's central bank. This is U.S. dollar denominated assets, and it's actually mostly euro denominated assets. And the U.S. government has been pushing really hard, pressuring Europe to seize this money from the Russian central bank and to use it to fund Ukraine. However, Europe is very hesitant. And why is that? Because this can blow up in the face of the West. Because if the US and EU seize this money from Russia's central bank, why would other countries around the world, why would their central banks hold US dollar assets and Euro assets? It would be crazy of them to do that. I mean, maybe if they're Western allies like Japan or South Korea, they wouldn't be afraid. Of course, they're militarily occupied by the U.S. and have been since the 40s or 50s. But if you are an independent country and you're not just completely obedient and subservient and don't just follow whatever the West tells you to do, you would start second guessing whether or not you should hold dollar or euro assets in your central bank. And this explains why so many central banks around the world are diversifying their reserves and holding other assets, especially gold, by the way. And this is why China has been selling off hundreds of billions of dollars of the treasury securities that it amassed over time because China realizes it could be next. I talked about this in a recent video. Central bankers and economists in China are very concerned that they could be next. And it's not just officials in China. It's even longtime U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Indonesia. Many central banks around the world are second guessing their holdings of Western assets. And what we're seeing is these U.S. officials like Lindsey Graham, they are calling for accelerating economic decoupling, the creation of new financial and economic institutions so countries can de-dollarize. They can trade in other currencies, especially their own local currencies. They don't need the U.S. dollar. They can hold other assets in their central bank foreign exchange reserves. This is all happening very quickly. And the U.S. has continued to sanction more and more countries and freeze their assets. It did it to Iran and then to Venezuela and then to Afghanistan and now to Russia. And this process is accelerating. Here at Geopolitical Economy Report, this is one of the main issues that we report on a lot, that we focus on, along with conflicts like the war in Ukraine. And we are trying to help educate people so you can understand what actually drives 
these geopolitical conflicts, which of course are always rooted in economics. So on that note, I want to conclude. I'm Ben Norton. I'm the editor-in-chief of Geopolitical Economy Report. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Please like and subscribe. Please share this, and I'll see you all next time.